Good evening, everyone. Uh, if I could have your attention, please. My name is uh, Professor Lori Patton, and I direct the Center for Faculty Development and Excellence at Emory University. And uh, you always know when someone really important and fun is here when at least two people talk before the person. Um, we promise that we'll make it brief. But we wanted to spend just a couple minutes describing to you the occasion for Nick Redding's visit. Um, this is the first of what we hope will be many occasions, annual occasions at Emory, um, of this new thing that we have developed at the CFDE, the center I direct, called the University Course. And the idea is, um, you know, President Wagner and Provost Lewis and many other folks at Emory talk about, well, do we want to be a multiversity or do we want to be a university? And one of the most important ways to think about that is, if you're really going to be a university, why not have a course offered by the university that anyone from any unit can get four credits for? So our first accomplishment is working with registrars in order to make that actually happen bureaucratically, which we're really proud of, and we can only do it one time this year before we have to do yet another round of bureaucracy. But uh, in addition, we um, had a, a wonderful set of conversations last year in a seminar called the Distinguished Teaching Scholars Seminar that's sponsored by CFDE, and that is where f a, a key faculty are nominated from each of the units at Emory, nursing, law, business, College of Arts and Sciences, and so on, to be the distinguished teaching fellow. And they get together to share best teaching practices. They are usually brilliant research scholars as well as pedagogues. And last year was our inaugural seminar. And we had the fortune of having both uh, Jeff Rosenzweig, who can't be with us tonight, and Morgan Cloud, um, who is with us tonight, to think about best pedagogical practices. And Jeff Rosenzweig asked a very simple question, which is, why don't faculty share their expertise more? We all have guest lecturers in class and things, but actually assuming that we all could bring our best forms of knowledge to solve a particular, or to address anyway, if not solve, a particular social problem was something that we really wanted to develop at Emory as a way of being a university. And so Morgan Cloud, whom I'm about, I'm about to introduce, said, I have just been um, bowled over by this wonderful book by Nick Redding called Methland about the use of meth in a small Iowa town, Olwine. And so as a result, we decided that the first university course, which now has students from all the different units, except we're sad to say medical school and nursing school, but we're hoping to fix that so their curriculum can get a little different for them to play, play with us in the same sandbox. Um, but every other unit at Emory is represented, and uh, we have 24 students, all bringing their relative expertise in business, law, philosophy, public health, uh, religion, uh, sociology, and so on, biology, to think through this problem of math. And as I said to Elaine Justice the other day, the only way I can describe the atmosphere in the class is that it is electric. It is just a phenomenal gathering of minds, both young and senior and, and all the way in between. And um, we're having a wonderful time. And so what we decided to do was build up our curiosity and thinking about meth through lectures in the biology of addiction and the uh, problems in international business and big pharma and questions of public health and definitions of addiction and health communication. And then in the middle of the sem semester, we'd bring the man himself to talk about his work in writing Methland and uh, why it still is uh, a topic that should get the foremost of public attention. So uh, we're delighted to be able to also sponsor a university-wide lecture, which is what we are embarking on tonight. The person I have really to thank for all of this wonderful um, energy and engagement across disciplines is uh, my colleague and friend Morgan Cloud. He is the Charles Howard Candler Professor, and he teaches and writes, as many of you know here, about criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional theory, and comparative constitutional law. And one of his early works we actually uh, read in the class on theories of addiction and um, legal procedure. 
He's the, also the author of Constitutional Criminal Procedure from an Investigation to Trial, which is a textbook which is now um, electric online. And he has written also on the question of mentally retarded suspects, the Fourth Amendment, torture and truth, and broader philosophical questions on the relationship between law and history. And among the many reasons why one receives a Candler professorship, the most important is citizenship in the university and the ability to draw together the small picture with the big picture. And I can't think of anyone who instantiates that better than my friend and colleague, Morgan Cloud, which I am going to welcome to the podium now. Thank you. You know, I kind of feel like I just was at my own wake. Uh, thank you, Lori. Uh, We're here to, to talk about Nick Redding, of course, and quickly I'll introduce him and then I'll talk a little bit about his book in just a slightly different way, but um, very much consistent with what Laurie just said about looking at things both from the small perspective and the big perspective. First, our author, Nick Redding, uh, is writing about the Midwest, Iowa. He's a Midwesterner. He was born and grew up in St. Louis, went to college at Northwestern University in Chicago, uh, where he got a degree in English and creative writing. He went to NYU and got an MFA in fiction writing. And um, from the mid-90s until two, just a couple of years ago, he lived in New York, edited and wrote for magazines in New York, and also taught creative writing uh, in the graduate school at George Mason University. He and his family have returned to St. Louis He's now teaching uh, in the English department at Washington University and working on his third book. I, I, as I was watching the news today and these just tremendous turn of events in Libya today, things, dramatic things happened today, uh, and people are now talking about war there, I began thinking, you know, in a month, just what an unbelievable month of events, Tunisia, that was kind of interesting, and then Egypt, and Libya, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, these tremendous events around the world make it almost seem prosaic, kind of mysterious why we would spend time talking about really anonymous people in this town that my guess is, unless you've read this book, you've never heard of Old Wine, Iowa, and I'm betting that Nick Redding and I are the only guys in the room who've ever been in Old Wine, Iowa. Uh, it's just, you know, it's nowhere. I grew up in Iowa, so I, I can say that, because it really is nowhere. Um, the unique contribution of this book, though, is that Nick Redding opens, and sometimes with just raw power, the lives of doctors, Lawyers, bikers, bartenders, junkies, sisters of celebrities, and shows us the just uh, lives of people just trying to find a way to live in this world that we all inhabit now in the 21st century. And, and for that alone, I think it would be a book worth reading. But what is unique about the book is he shows how these individual lives these really often pathetic and sometimes really not very appealing junkies, how their lives aren't just the product of what's happened in the world. They're not just the product of globalization of economics or business, the, the product of government activity that often seems to be in the service of these corporate interests rather than the people who live in the countries, of this international, this desperate international pressure of people living in poverty, trying to move somewhere else to have a better life, materially, socially, and to escape the tyranny of life in some places in the world. All of these global forces are not just the causes of the realities that lead to these people being addicts or leaving the, having to leave Old Wine, Iowa to make a living. The stories of those people are just, in, in just bound 
to these global events. They aren't separate. They aren't cause and effect. Nick Redding shows us how they are part of the same process and how if people in Egypt or Atlanta are going to find a way in this world now, we have to understand that our lives, personal and local, are tied to these tremendous global forces. And so I think this book is a unique point for us to talk, to learn, to understand about what's happening in Libya today by having Nick Redding take us to Old Wine, Iowa. Nick Redding. Thank you for, uh, for having me. I don't know that I uh, believe any of that that Morgan just said to be true um, about me individually or about um, this book, but I'm, I'm glad that you said it nonetheless. Um, and uh, I find it hard to believe that there's a, a course that focuses on it, um, but I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm honored uh, whether or not I think it's a good idea. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I suppose a number of you have uh, been forced by Morgan or somebody else to to read the book and so um, I'll try and tell you some new things if you're part of that uh, fraction of the audience and and if you're not I guess I would just start by saying that um, uh, the book is about Old Wine Iowa it's about four years in the life of this town um, and more specifically, it follows uh, four years in the life um, of an addict and a trafficker, um, uh, the mayor, uh, the doctor, and the prosecutor. Um, I think what I was sort of aiming at, um, and I don't know if I achieved it or not, was uh, to, to try and put into perspective um, uh, what 30 years of um, an economic and cultural and social sea change, um, uh, whether you're a, a Reagan Republican and call it deregulation or a, a Clinton Democrat and call it globalization is sort of irrelevant. What that looks like on a Tuesday afternoon in a place that you've never been and how it affects the lives there. Um, uh, so, um, uh, after I'm, I'm done talking to you a little bit, it would, it would be merciful uh, for me uh, if you wanted to ask questions. I do better with that than I do uh, with the talking part. Um, and I would be more than happy to stay as long as you'll have me. Um, but uh, I'm going to start out reading to you a little bit from the book and, uh, and then just try and put together some of the different um, uh, vectors that, uh, uh, to me, came together to change life uh, in this place. This is um, uh, from chapter two of the book. It's called the, uh, the Most American Drug. And um, this depicts something that happened to one of the, the main characters whose name is Roland Jarvis. On a cold winter night in 2001, Roland Jarvis looked out the window of his mother's house and saw that the old wine police had hung live human heads in the trees of the yard. Jarvis knew the police did this when they meant to spy on people suspected of being meth cooks. The heads were informants, placed like demonic ornaments to look in the windows and through the walls. As Jarvis studied them, they mumbled and squinted hard to see what was inside the house. And then the heads, satisfied that Jarvis was in fact cooking meth in the basement, conveyed the message to a black helicopter hovering over the house. The whoosh of the blades was hushed and all but inaudible. So Jarvis didn't notice the helicopter till he saw the heads tilt back on their limbs and stare at the cold night sky. 
By then, Jarvis knew he had to hurry. Once the helicopter sent coordinates to the cop shop, it would be only moments before they raided the house. Jarvis ran downstairs to the basement. He was wearing a Minnesota Vikings tank top, a pair of boxer shorts, and white tube socks. A divorced 35-year-old father of four who'd been making meth since the mid-1990s and using the drug since he was 16, Jarvis had been in jail all but three of the last 10 years. He did not want to go back. So bottle by bottle and container by container, he poured down the flood drain in the floor of his mother's basement the chemicals that he had stored there. Anhydrous ammonia, Coleman's lantern fluid, denatured alcohol, and kerosene. Finally, he poured two gallons of hydrochloric acid down the drain. Then he lit a cigarette. People around town like to say that Roland Jarvis blew himself up. The sound Jarvis heard immediately following the click of his lighter, though, was not anything like an explosion. It was a very distinct and very quiet sucking sound. It took about a quarter of a second for the ionized hydrogen and the hydrochloric acid to propagate from the lighter's flame and into the drain. This made the entire basement into a vacuum. Jarvis heard a soft whoomp. Then came the blast, the force of which blew out the windows and singed Jarvis's body wherever it wasn't covered by clothing. In the space of several more tenths of a second, all of his exposed body hair burned off. When he looked down, he saw that his tube socks were somehow no longer on his feet. When he looked up, he saw that the wooden ceiling was consumed by animate, expanding rivulets of blue flame. His mother, who was something of a pack rat, had stored her deceased husband's books, clothes, and fishing equipment in boxes in the basement, alongside old furniture that she couldn't bear to sell, for it had been in her family since the days before her grandmother left Sicily. Now, all of it was on fire. Oxygen poured into the basement through the blown out windows, feeding the flames. Jarvis's tank top was burning, so he took it off and went running up the stairs and out onto the porch. He stood there a while, thinking. Then he decided to go back into the house. For 45 minutes, Jarvis made one trip after another into his mother's home, even as the fire spread from room to room and floor to floor. He filled a plastic mop bucket over and over and fought the fire relentlessly, stopping every now and again to bring a couch or a table outside into the brutal Iowa night. At one point, dissatisfied with the water output of the kitchen sink, Jarvis claims that he harnessed the superhuman strength afforded him by the dual effects of his meth high and his panicked adrenaline rush to pull the sink from its housing in the counter and throw it against a wall in a blind rage. Jarvis says he wanted to save the house. It's considered a foregone conclusion by the police that he was trying to retrieve the remnants of his meth lab along with the formidable amount of dope that he had been making. For Jarvis, in a town full of meth cooks, was considered one of the finest and most prolific of their number. That, or he was attempting to spread the fire himself in order to burn as much evidence as possible. It's conceivable, too, that he was in such a state of psychotic disarray, emotional bankruptcy, and physical disembodiment that he was actually trying to do all three of those things. What stopped him in any event is that he began to melt. Following one of his trips outside, Jarvis looked down and saw what he thought was egg white on his bare arms. It was not egg white. It was the viscous state of his skin now that the water had boiled out of it. Jarvis flung it off himself, and then he saw that where the egg white had been, he could now see roasting muscle. He looked at his legs and his abdomen. His skin was dripping off his body in sheets. Panicked, standing there in the frigid night, outside the inferno of his mother's home, 
naked but for his boxer shorts, which he'd inadvertently soaked in water while fighting the fire, Roland Jarvis began pushing sheets of skin from himself, using his hands like blunt tools, wiping and shoving the hide from as much of his body as he could reach. He'd have pulled the melting skeins of skin from himself in bigger, more efficient sections, but for the fact that his fingers had burned off his hands. His nose was all but gone now, too, and he ran back and forth among the gathered neighbors, unable to scream, for his esophagus and his voice box had cooked inside of his throat. The police, says Jarvis, just watched. Jeremy Logan was still a sergeant back then, and a man with whom Jarvis had gone to high school. When Jarvis approached him, Logan moved away like a matador avoiding a bull, not because he took sadistic pleasure in Jarvis's plight, but because, as Logan later said, no one knew what to do. Jarvis begged in vain for someone to shoot him. He was burning alive, and the pain was unbearable. Not even the paramedics knew how to respond, says Jarvis. He says everyone watching, the gathered neighbors, the police, the entire old wine fire department wanted him to die. And I don't blame them, he says. What else could you do with a man like me? Um, so that's kind of a extreme example, I think, of, of what happens when the kind of, um, of vectors come together um, that I'm, I'm talking about. And, and so what I'd like to do is, is try and put this particular incident, that being the defining one in the life of this man, certainly, uh, who lived through this, by the way. He spent three years and uh, three months in the burn unit at the uh, University of Iowa Hospital um, in Iowa City, um, during which time he had four heart attacks. Um, and uh, he got home after those three months, and the first thing that he did, according to him, uh, was to get high. Uh, he could no longer um, uh, shoot meth. He'd been an intravenous meth addict. Um, but he taught himself how to um, light a lighter uh, with what was left of his hands. Um, in fact, um, oftentimes when I would go visit him where he was living in his mother's home, um, we'd sit around and watch TV or just do whatever it was that he was doing that day. And um, this is uh, four or five years after this incident. and. Uh, for the most part, every time that I went to visit him, uh, he was high and sometimes would uh, smoke a foil in front of me. Um, he's, in some ways, the billboard intractable meth addict. Um, but um, the, one of the reasons that I wanted to use his story in the book is not for the um, hyperbolicness of it, not for the sensationalness of it, um, but because it is an extreme example, I think, of behaviors that don't happen in a vacuum. Um, that's not to say that these different sort of social vectors are an excuse for what Roland Jarvis became. Uh, I'm simply trying to suggest in this book that him and people like him um, happen to live in a world where there's a certain amount of interconnectedness um, uh, between things that you wouldn't necessarily think, I don't think, or that I didn't going into this as, as a journalist, strictly as a journalist, that I would never have thought of beforehand. Um, so the context in which this man's life unfolded and continues to unfold um, is one that's changed quite a bit in the last 40 years. Uh, the town of Old Wine um, uh, for a long time was a very prosperous place. Um, in keeping with uh, the way that much of the Midwest was set up 
dating back to the Northwest Territories Act um, on, on the county system. Um, there's lots of counties and all of them have five or ten towns or something like that and there's usually a big one somewhere in the middle. Um, and old wine for Fayette County, Iowa was the big shakes in the area. Um, but every town would have been a self-sustaining place. Um, the thing that made old wine very wealthy uh, was meat packing and the railroad and of course the ubiquitous um, uh, farming and, and animal husbandry. Um, and for a hundred years this worked beautifully there. In fact, um, as recently as, as the mid-70s, um, that's not true, until almost 1990, um, there were 7,000 people in town and 2,000 of them were employed by the meatpacking plant. That's not 2,000 people of employable age, that is 2,000 people of the entire population. Um, they had uh, uh, the biggest engine shops west of the Mississippi um, and so the railroad employed a large number of people. Um, the average size of a farm was somewhere around 200 acres. Uh, there was no such thing as unemployment in Old Wine, Iowa. Um, this is true, you know, I, I sort of take Old Wine to be um, emblematic of many, many places in the Midwest. Um, in fact, um, there are direct correlations that can be drawn not just between old wine and the thousands of towns like it throughout the region, uh, but between old wine and Cincinnati and Cleveland and Chicago, St. Louis, Indy, KC, you name it. Um, a lot of them worked because of um, their, uh, they were economically useful based on many of the same industries uh, which revolved around agriculture and heavy manufacturing and even light manufacturing. Um, this began to change enormously around um, 1980 with the farm crisis, which is a sort of complicated story in and of itself. Um, but at the time, in a very short period, 66% uh, of all farms in the county that old, that old Wine is in, Fayette County, Iowa, 66% of all the farms went out of business. Um, shortly thereafter, the engine shops closed uh, because the railroad went out of business. Um, by about 1990, uh, globalization was in full, was happening in full effect. Um, one, of the, one of the things that precipitated this was the wholesale change in the meatpacking industry. Um, and there was a company called Iowa Beef Packers that went and bought distressed assets around the Midwest in the form of meatpacking plants. Um, how they did this, it's in some ways very good business, um, at least as I think, as we think of it in the capitalist society. Um, they, and there's, this is on the public record, I mean it happened all over Iowa and the Dakotas, down to Indiana and to Missouri, pretty much you name it. Um, companies like IBP would uh, hold a town meeting and they would go in and they would say, 66% um, of your farms have gone out of business. The railroad's no longer here. What you have left is meat packing and we are going to buy your meat packing plant. And, um, we will buy it under the condition that you dissolve the union. Um, otherwise, we will buy it and we will bankrupt it. Um, we will fold it into something else. Uh, given that choice, a place like Old Wine, Iowa says, well, sure, you can buy the meat packing plant. Sure, we'll dissolve the union. Um, a guy like Jarvis, uh, who had been making $18 an hour in the mid 80s, um, comes to work one day to the next 
and instead of making $18 with full benefits and owning $5,000 of stock in the meatpacking plant, he's now making $5.60 with no stock and no benefits. Um, so if you take these three things together, um, the loss of the railroad, the loss of two-thirds of the family farms, and essentially a two-thirds uh, pay cut at the meat packing plant. I mean, let's say you extrapolate that on to, I mean, what would Atlanta have to lose in order to lose that much revenue? Um, it's a sort of apocalyptic. I mean, a place that has existed doing these very specific things and doing them very well uh, for a hundred years, 125 years, um, suddenly isn't doing them anymore. Um, Things that people take for granted, such as, uh, you know, you walk down the street, you expect the street lights will be on at night, right? You expect that if you um, take your child to school tomorrow morning, that the school's not going to be bankrupt, right? Um, you expect that you'll be able to go out on Saturday night and have a meal at the local restaurant. Um, you expect that there is money to pay police officers. Um, I expect that where I live, there will be a mayor and a city council. All of a sudden, these things are thrown completely into the realm of there is no expectation of that. Um, where are you going to come up with the money to do it? Um, if people don't have jobs anymore and everything is gone, there's no tax revenue. If there's no tax revenue, then it's hard to do simple things that a town has to do because a town like a county and like a state and like a nation is a business. And there is no guarantee in the world post-1990 that the business of Old Wine, Iowa would continue to be able to function. Um, this, what happened there again is, 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 is you know, we, we talk about things that are, have become, I think, part of our uh, social and intellectual and, and, and cultural collective knowledge. You know, we talk about the auto industry in Detroit. We talk about the steel industry in Pittsburgh. Um, that's all part and parcel of the same thing. Um, that's just a bigger example of what was going on in old wine. Um, smaller towns have a hard time absorbing that kind of loss of revenue. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, the truth of it and is that anything that was done in the Midwest for 125 plus years uh, can be done more cheaply somewhere else. I mean, that's just the truth of it. Um, that is sort of what was beginning to happen at that time, at, around the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so a guy like Jarvis looks around, and many people like him, and they do the math, and he says, well, I can either keep doing meth, which he's been doing for quite some time, um, it's a very common drug. I mean, it's sort of, you know, this idea that there's a meth epidemic and it's a new thing is not really true. There have been a number of meth epidemics around the world in the last century. It's in fact an old drug. It was first synthesized in Japan in 1898. Um, it was given in huge quantities to American, British, German, and Imperial Japanese servicemen. Um, in fact, one of the, the first two great meth epidemics of the century happened in uh, post-Nazi Germany, Germany and, and post-Imperial Japan because you had all these servicemen who were essentially meth addicts and they came home and there were huge stockpiles of the drug being made by pharmaceutical companies. Um, and so black markets sprang up all over the place. Um, they didn't just stop doing meth because they're no longer fighting. Uh, it's a very useful drug for, for people who do the kind of thing that Roland Jarvis was doing uh, or that servicemen do. Um, you don't have to eat, you don't have to sleep, you don't have to 
drink water, you feel really good, you can stay awake forever. Uh, short term, it increases your ability to concentrate um, and um, allows you to go a long time, do a lot of hard work. Um, you know, in my telling, to me, that makes it partially what I call the most American drug because I think that um, throughout its history in this country, which is very long, um, it has been the drug that has helped uh, because it helps you work harder, helps you in some ways um, achieve the American ideal of superseding class through hard work. Um, and you feel good the whole time too. Um, so it's a, it's a drug with, with a long history. Um, and so somebody who is familiar with this drug like, like, like Roland, um, you know, he says, look, I can keep doing this and I'm gonna now have to work three shifts at a meat packing plant at 560 an hour in order to mathematically reach just below where I was yesterday, making 18 an hour. Um, and I'm gonna spend X amount a week on some meth, that's the only way I can stay awake to be able to do this. Um, or I can start making it myself. And I can sell to the people who are left at the packing plant um, who uh, wanna buy the meth so they can keep working hard. Um, this is a pretty common phenomenon. In fact, one of the things that I saw a lot of is um, that uh, people like Roland would consider themselves to be the last of the independent entrepreneurs in a place that um, in some ways had been economically uh, degraded by uh, the, these developing vertical monopolies um, in, in certain corporate sectors like meatpacking and like agriculture. Um, as, as this trend continued throughout the 80s and the 90s and into the 2000s, uh, meatpacking became just a small part of a huge vertical monopoly that included every conceivable aspect of the American food business, um, such that uh, today there are five companies that essentially control 80% of it. Um, and uh, when I say 80% of it, what I mean is, uh, let's take Cargill for an example. Um, not only might they own a lot of the land on which the corn and the beans are farmed, um, uh, due to a joint venture that they entered with Monsanto in 96, uh, they own the genetic rights to the seed itself and the seed. So if you wanna farm that land that's not owned by you, you have to buy seed from them. Um, they own the grain elevator where uh, things are stored. They own the corn dryers that dry the corn in a wet year, which God knows there's been a lot of recently up there. Um, they own the barge that takes the grain down the river. They own the trucking company. Uh, they own uh, the ranch where the cows come from. They own the feed lot where the cows go. Um, they own the the, the, uh, they own all the, po the poultry, they own the pork, the, the, the pigs, um, all the way down to the supermarket. So, um, you know, what this means, again, on a, on a micro level, is that in a place like Old Wine, where people used to own a lot of this stuff themselves, not only do they not own their land anymore, and not only is the packing plant essentially gone and the railroad's gone, they don't own the grain elevator, they don't, the, they don't own the store, they don't own anything. And so, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about meth, or, or two things that are interesting in that context, is that I think we take it as a foregone conclusion in many ways that um, drugs and poverty go together. Um, what's interesting to me is that a lot of people seem to resist the idea that drugs and poverty could go together in rural America as opposed to the inner city. Um, I don't quite know why that is. Uh, people feel extremely, they're vehement about it, in fact, uh, when this book came out, I got a number of, of death threats and, and 
Um, several of them uh, were sort of steeped in this idea that, that I had betrayed um, America by writing about this. Um, and I had betrayed this place, capital T, capital P. I had, you know, betrayed where I'm from, essentially. Um, which I don't really buy. <laughs> but uh, one of the other things about meth is that there's no crop to grow. Um, it's, it's a purely um, synthetic drug, and so you can make it in your sink. I mean, we read about it all the time, right? So when you add that into the mix, um, and you add the idea that these places in many ways exist at large from the notion of, let's just say, federal law enforcement. I mean, there's no DEA presence in Old Wine, Iowa. Um, there's no FBI presence. It's an easier place to go into, into, into business that way because there's not 13 cops anymore. There's only six. Um, all of this comes together in, in a way that, that, that I would not say that's what changed life there. What, to, in my telling, the meth epidemic was simply a signal to the rest of us that something had moved into a vacuum. So what, what was the vacuum that was created? Where did it come from? Um, and why is meth the thing that moved in? Um, I guess, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, the, there's a whole other organized crime aspect to the whole thing that, 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 um, that's also um, complicates it even further um, and, and, and sort of makes the conclusion easier to reach. Um, I, I'm afraid that getting into that will take a little bit longer than we have. I, I guess, I guess the, 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 where I'm headed with this is um, that what, what comes into being is uh, a sort of cycle of, of, of decline um, such that um, you know, when old wine suddenly becomes a place where in a town of 6,000 people, the police are busting a meth lab every three days. That's a lot of meth labs in a town of 6,000 people. Um, then the prosecutor who happens to be involved with a Department of Human Services um, worker uh, finds it really hard to go out socially anymore because there's so many people that he grew up with that he's now had to put in jail. And if he put him in jail, then it's more than likely that his girlfriend under the auspices of the state had to take their children away from him. So you wouldn't think about that normally, but now suddenly you have a sort of pillar of the town in the form of the prosecutor who doesn't want to leave his house. He has a hard time living. He's isolated in his own place. Then you've got the town doctor who now 90% of what he does day in and day out is to treat people for things that are meth related, whether it's depression because your son is a meth addict or your husband is in jail or whether it's something extreme like what happened with Jarvis. Um, there's any number of things that begin to, I mean, the, the mayor's job becomes something that seems almost impossible because first he's got to try and resurrect a town from this sort of economic apocalypse. And oh, by the way, he's also got to deal with the fact that there's two meth lab busts every week. Um, and, 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 you know, according to, to me, what, what seems to happen is that this only uh, increases this kind of collective feeling of, of depression. Um, and that, in turn, continues to breed people who want to do a drug that makes them feel better than they've ever felt in their life. Um, so. That's kind of what the book is about. I'm sure that all of you are 
dying to read it now that I've made it sound so fun. Um, and it's also about the fact that old wine does, in fact, um, make what to me seems like kind of a miraculous comeback. So there is that, there is that in the last third of the book. Um, you know, I guess at this point, um, there's a whole bunch of things I think that we could talk about, but I would love to hear if anybody has any questions um, or would like me to, I don't know, expand, or maybe you'd just like me to run away because I'm depressing. Um, I'll spend as long as anybody, it doesn't matter, 20, 30 minutes, whatever you want. That's, that's fine, I had lunch. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> so during your speech, you identified yourself as a journalist, but I was just wondering if you identify with any other disciplines like anthropology or sociology or anything like that, urban studies? I mean, I, I don't. I, I've, you know, I, I never studied journalism or sociology or anthropology. Um, um, so, no, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I'm aware of them as disciplines, certainly, and I guess people have, 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 people have asked me that before, and all I know to say is, is I, I, I don't know too much about it, really. Sorry. <laughs> so, when you were setting up like this study, how did, what did you look to for like your inspiration, or how to even go about the field study? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a. Um, I am a, a terrible, you know, it's like if, if writing is about character, place, and plot, I'm really bad with plot. And um, I'm pretty bad with place. The thing that attracts me continually is people. So, um, you know, what, what attracted me to this story initially was uh, I just had the good luck of, or I should say the people who ended up in the book had the bad luck of befriending me, and and that was really the sole motivation. It was, um, it was just to try and understand um, how these big things come to play in these individual lives on a daily basis. Um, all the rest of it was a lot harder for me to do than that was. Thank you. How do you think that the legal system should be reformed to deal with uh, the ever-growing drug problem in America? Do you think that something like drug courts would be more effective? I, I am a, a, a fan of, of drug courts. I, I think that they are an exceedingly reasonable way to go about um, dealing with you know the symptomology of 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 of, of the drug problem, um, and what I mean by that is that to me there there are other there are so many endemic factors that are that are larger, uh, but to, that have to do with economic trends and and um, uh, and on on some very simple level, just an inability or an unwillingness or a lack of political will, I think, to talk honestly about how all these things work together. Uh, I mean, for instance, one of the stickier ones is you know the connection between um, major narco trafficking and in this country and our immigration policy. I mean, that's a particularly spiny one to try and tackle. Um, but in just so far as um, in most places, there are a certain percentage of people who not only do drugs but get caught for it, uh, doing it, selling it, whatever. Um, and there's, it seems pretty clear to me that putting them in prison doesn't work so great. Um, I mean, in Iowa, as an example, um, if you were, were to get, when I was there, if you were to get caught with 
uh, for manufacture with intent to distribute, you would be given a six-year sentence and you'd be out in nine months. And the reason is there's not enough room in jail and there's not enough money to feed the people that are there. And so, you know, politicians there and everywhere else love to talk tough about putting people in jail. Well, hell, they can't afford it, <laughs> you know, but they don't say that. Then you take something like, like a drug court, which, again, I think is a very reasonable way of dealing with it. Um, in fact, Fayette County just started their own about three months ago. And uh, outside of where I live in Franklin County, they've had one for six years. And they have a very high rate of uh, keeping people out of jail. Um, so that to me is, 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 is probably the one thing that I think uh, legally in the country is really worthwhile. Um, you spoke about the sociological effects um, in your book and in your lecture that methamphetamine had in a small town. Um, based on your observations, how is meth different from other drugs that often will circ can circulate in a community where people are dependent on them while selling them, such as crack cocaine or marijuana? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that it's all just a, it's, it's just a horse of a different color, you know? I mean, I don't think that there's a difference between um, the, the detrimental uh, effects you know, collectively um, on a community between crack and, and meth. Um, so it's just so happened that in, in this place, um, meth was more the thing. And, um, but I think the, I think the, and, and, and there, are, there are differences again, just in terms of, you know, people's ability to make it. Um, and, also, um, the idea that um, meth is a very, very valuable drug from a trafficking standpoint um, for the reason that um, large-scale makers of it don't have to depend on anybody else to provide them with the raw material. Um, and so it's possible for trafficking organizations to in, in, own the entire value chain of meth manufacture, distribution, and retail, as opposed to having to rely on people to grow it in Colombia or grow heroin, you know, poppies in Afghanistan or whatever, and they lose out on that part of the business um, and, and are beholden not just to that, but to the whims of climate and, and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, um, whatever it is that takes root in a particular community um, is equally and definingly damaging. Um, I am not an expert on crack by any means, um, but it would seem to me that many of the same economic vectors that have that contributed to the large-scale use of that drug in urban environments are absolutely no different than the ones that contribute to large-scale meth use in the rural United States. Um, and, you know, that's anecdotal as far as, as I can tell, but, you know, we've got a lot of crack in the city of St. Louis, and in many ways what's happened in St. Louis is exactly what's happened in old wine in the last 40 years. Um, just at a different order of magnitude. Um. Thank you. Has anything been done to address the problems that lead people to do meth in the first place? Like, if, has there been an effort to, uh, <clears throat> like, reuse, uh, reunionize the meatpacking industry or help people find ways to cope with life in Iowa other than meth? Say the first part of your question again. Uh, it has, has anything been done to help uh, address the sort of problems that lead to the widespread meth use um, and sort of attack it at the source before people, you know, uh, start doing meth? You know, um, I mean, the, the, the tack that this particular town took was to say um, that uh, meth isn't our problem, our economy is our problem, and if we begin to deal with that, then we will 
um, effectively, you know, uh, kill two birds in one shot. Um, and I and and it, and it it worked. It continues to work very well there. One of the thing that, things that has happened is that the meth problem has just moved down the street to the next town. Uh, there's, in fact, there's been kind of a curious um, inversion between old wine used to, when it was really stuck in hard times in the late 90s and, and even when I was there, even more particularly, it was sort of considered to be um, the ghetto of a town called Independence, which is about 13 miles away, um, which was a place that happened to be doing quite well. Um, now those two have switched and Independence kind of has inherited old wine's meth problem. One of the reasons being that there's only, you know, again, to go back in some ways to how the Midwest was, was set up. Um, I mean, dating back to the Northwest Territories Act, with the idea that there's a county and there's 10 towns and, and, um, and there needs to be that based on, um, you know, farmers got to bring things to market and this town makes shoes and the next one makes cigars and this one builds railroad cars and whatever. Um, that paradigm doesn't work anymore because those places don't, essentially the problem that people run into is that where there used to be 10 towns, there's only enough money for maybe two. And so, you know, what's happened in Fayette County is that um, old wine has gotten rid of their meth problem as they have increased their sort of market share, if you will, uh, economically, but that's just less money that goes to everywhere else in the county. So, swaps. Um, I don't know what to do about that particular aspect of the problem. Um, I mean, that's really the biggie. I mean, that's what I'm writing my next book about, is essentially what's going to happen because of that. Um, and I don't know the answer. Thank you. I have a question, sir. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the book, partly because I am a law professor and I work in criminal law and I've been studying things like the use of drugs and the drug prohibition system for a long time. For, uh, you're right, meth, obviously meth has been around for a long time, and I always thought of it as like 300 pound guys with long greasy hair, tattoos, wearing vests and no shirt, riding their Harleys. That's what I always thought of meth in terms of that being the distribution network. Your friends then. What? My fr yeah. <laughs> That's where I grew up, as my, you know, my family. Um, and, and this, one of the things that, that that I thought was so interesting in, in, in your story is how uh, immigration from the South, from Central America and Mexico, becomes coupled with a new kind of gang and a new distribution system that becomes almost more integral. It's like it's integral to the culture and the economy of this place as opposed to these bikers out on the edge of town in their warehouse uh, doing weird stuff that nobody really wants to know about. All of a sudden it becomes kind of integrated into the workplace. And, and I wonder if you could talk about that. Um, you know, uh, in fact, the last time I was in, and the only time I was in Atlanta, it was to, um, it was to interview uh, people for this this book, and and one of the people that I talked to was the woman who was in charge of the DEA office at the time, and she said something to me that I thought was, um, it's just stuck with me. And she said the mistake that people make when they try and understand the drug business is um, they think of it as something other than what it is, which is just a business, um, and so. Uh, one of the things that Morgan is alluding to um, is that there was a wholesale change in the n narcotics distribution industry in this country, which we all know to be the most lucrative on earth, um, around about the same time that the farm crisis happened and all this other business was going on. Um, 
and that sea change was essentially that um, from a, a fairly kind of uh, disparate and diasporatic um, uh, number of entities, including you know the Colombians that everybody thinks about, or uh, Nigerians, Jamaicans, Filipino organized crime. From that, uh, they owned the American narc illicit narcotics business. Um, five Mexican cartels were able to take over um, almost the entire business, 85%. So whether you're talking about cocaine, meth, uh, brown heroin, or marijuana, it makes no difference. Five Mexican cartels own that entire business. Um, this is a big deal because uh, they're exceedingly powerful. Um, and because uh, Mexico is not in South America, uh, it's not in the Caribbean, um, it is not in Southeast Asia, it is next door. Um, the point I made about drug business being just a business, um, it, the, the stroke of genius that these organizations had was that they could map distribution and retail routes onto um, immigration routes. And um, that they could use some fractional part of a fairly amoebic, um, difficult to track um, population that was spreading throughout the United States, thereby making it harder for anybody to catch them. Um, you know, one of the ironies, and so, and so there, there you have the modern history of American narco trafficking, essentially, in a nutshell. Um, and um, of course, as the meatpacking plants are cutting wages and everybody else is cutting wages, then um, you know the, the same companies are also advertising in Mexico to bring people here. I mean, you know, uh, you know it because Tyson's kind of big down here, and and uh, uh, it's just how it works. Um, and one of the one of the ironies is that it seems to me at this point that. Really, if we go back to the idea that there need be only two towns where there have been 10 for 150 years, seems to me that the ones that are going to make it are actually the ones that have the largest immigrant populations because they're some of the only towns. I mean, Iowa is a classic example. It's per capita the oldest um, uh, the oldest state in the country, the, the, the average age or the median age in Iowa was older than anywhere else in the country. The Midwest in general has an aging population. Um, depopulation is a huge part of why we've lost so much tax revenue. The people leave. Um, so towns like, like Storm Lake, as an example, um, which has a huge immigrant population, something like 75% seven, of the kindergarten class in Storm Lake, Iowa, which is a town of, I don't know, somewhere, give or take 10,000 people, 75% are children who were not born here. Um, there's towns in Minnesota, my aunt lives in one of them, uh, in the town where she lives, there's 60 languages spoken in her town, and there's only 14,000 people there. But these are places that are actually growing. Um, so, I th it seems to me sort of ironic that one of the things that has frankly contributed to decline is in fact the one thing that may save a lot of these places. Hi. So um, you talk in the book a bit about how uh, Warner Lambert and um, later Pfizer was uh, close to coming up with a form of ephedrine that would have or pseudoephedrine that would have essentially ended the meth uh, problem mm -hmm. um, and stopped because of bureaucracy. They, they could lobby around it. Is there some responsibility, do you think, that um, for the pharmaceutical companies and the lobbyists and for the bureaucracy itself, uh, 
you know, is there some responsibility there for uh, for the continuing meth problem? Some taking of responsibility or, on their behalf? No, some uh, some non <laughs> um, non taking responsibility. Essentially, should should they should they be held responsible? Is is there a bigger problem here? Is that part of the cause of this problem? I well, I think so. I, I I mean, yeah, I think undeniably. I mean. Um, you know, the, the thing to which he's referring is that, um, and this is another thing that's unique about meth, is that meth is made from pseudoephedrine. The only other thing in the world that's made with pseudoephedrine is cold medicine. That's why Sudafed is called Sudafed. So, um, again, as opposed to, uh, you know, cocaine, which is uh, dependent on coca, um, the thing that you need to make meth this illicit narcotic exists at a one-to-one -one ratio with the manufacture of potentially the world's most lucrative drug, which is cold medicine. Um, and so essentially when, when there's a lot, as long as there's an unending supply of pseudoephedrine that's easy to get, then large trafficking organizations and small-time cooks like Roland Jarvis will be able to get it easily and turn it into meth. Um, what's galling to me is that as long ago as 1997, um, cold there, there, were, there were two things that happened in 1997. One is that Warner Lambert, which ultimately became part of Pfizer, um, had done, uh, they had created additives that could be put into cold medicine that would, that would make it impossible to extract the pseudoephedrine. Um, it was already FDA approved. Um, and nothing ever came of it. Um, despite the fact that DEA had been attempting to push American pharmaceutical companies to do that very thing, among other things, for 20 years already. Um, the other thing back in 97 is that there was research on what's a drug called mirror image pseudoephedrine, um, which showed great promise as a building block for cold medicine. And the difference between mirror image pseudoephedrine and regular pseudo is that you can't make meth out of, out of mirror image pseudo. Um, so there were these, and, and then there's also the thing that you now see on your shelf, which is cold medicine made with phenylephrine. So what I'm trying to say is that there were a number of different options that pharmaceutical companies had in order to make their cold medicine out of things that couldn't be made into meth. And we're being asked, that we're being pleaded with by DEA to do that very thing, and they simply refused. Um, and so, and, and even today, still, they refuse to do it. I mean, something that you need to know about the, the production of cold medicine is that all the pseudo in the entire world is only manufactured in nine plants. They're mostly in Germany, China, and Czech Republic. And so, in order for this hugely lucrative business to operate, they have to get all of their uh, of their raw material from nine plants. There is not only precedent in the past with other drugs, but it is reasonable to suggest that if a company like Pfizer said, look, we don't want, we're not going to make our cold medicine out of pseudoephedrine anymore. In fact, we're going to use this other FDA approved thing that we don't have to spend any money in order to have approval for. We're going to make the cold medicine out of that. These nine plants are not going to say, well, sorry, we're not going to make that anymore. Because then who are they going to sell to? So to me, there's a tremendous amount of culpability in the idea that people simply won't do a simple thing that would be just the right thing to do. But they don't have to because at every turn, lobbyists on behalf of these companies are able to so neuter any legislation written by DEA, stretching back for 35 years, that they don't need to be bothered. Um, I, that's wrong. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, I was just wondering from a practical perspective how authors like yourself um, receive funding for a project like this um, because I'm sure it's not free to write a book. From Morgan. No, I'm, like, um, do you have to, do you have it to pitch it the idea first or? Yeah, I mean, uh, so um, uh, nonfiction is sold on a proposal so um, as opposed to if you want to publish a novel then you got to write the whole thing and then try and sell the whole thing, at which point your editor will tell you everything that's wrong with it, and then you have to go write the whole thing over. Um, but nonfiction is sold on a proposal, and so uh, a, a proposal is essentially a, a sort of a narrative business plan that attempts to say, you know, this book is like uh, these three others that were incredibly successful, but it's different in the following very important ways. Um, and these are the people I'm going to write about, even though we haven't really done any reporting yet. It's kind of a wink-wink sort of a deal. Um, and then as a result of the proposal, uh, you get uh, an advance. And, um, and then, uh, you know, your payments are structured. So I did not, my, um, I did not go into this book without uh, any money up front. Um. Um, I'm interested to know, you mentioned at the beginning just how strong a response this book um, provoked, and also it's clearly produced a lot of interest across the country. Why, from your perspective, uh, have these responses arisen at this time, and uh, what would your perspective on that be? Uh, if I knew the answer to that, then I would, I would know just just the book to write next and I would know why I was writing it and, and that it would be success. I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, um, I, I, I really don't know the answer to that question aside from the fact that, um, I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, you know, math is something that seems to fascinate people. Um, I mean, it is sort of a, a part of life in a large part of the country. It's a part of life in every part of the country. I think it's something that people uh, are scared of. And, um, you know, I mean, I would like to think that, you know, I think there's this, and I'm told this, I, I don't know if this is true, but I'm told that, you know, people have, I'm told this by the people who threatened me with death for writing the book, that there's this idea that there's something sacred about the middle of the country and, you, and the rural United States, and you put those two things together, and, and it just made a lot of people mad, and it made some people, I think, surprised. And, you know, I mean, I tell my students all the time, if you can surprise people at the same time as you make them mad, you've probably written a pretty good paper, you know. Um, Best guess. Thank you. At the beginning, of the, when he started talking, uh, Nick made me pretty nervous when he got him and said, I, I don't really like doing this talking thing. I'm like, God, we got an hour. And a, you know, he, I don't know if he's just self-deprecating or doesn't appreciate how terrific you are at presenting this. That was fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.